Somebody's in deep shit. See that whole thing where the yes, oh, fuck that. Don't worry absolutely. About that. Don't worry All right. about that. All right, I won't worry about it. I'll keep it. <laughs> it's advisory only. It's, it's merely a suggestion. All right. All right. There we go. So, uh, check, check. Microphone check. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Um, everybody want to come on in and uh, get a comfy seat and everything? So, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce John Callis as our keynote speaker tonight. Uh, I don't know why John talks to me, because he speaks on a plane much higher than I will ever exist on. Uh, is Don here? Toy collector. What was the gear you had earlier? The what? Kerna? Kerna, yeah. Kerna. So I, a toy collector walks up and pulls this little cylinder out and hands it to me. And if anyone's ever been around that guy before, you have to be very careful when he hands you something. It may be incendiary. It, I don't know. It may be it's machined. It's going to be cool. Uh, he hands it to me. He's like, hey, check this out. And I crack this thing open. Oh, here, here you go. Here's a picture of it. It's the manual. Yeah. It, he pulls it out, and John goes, oh, I know what that is. And there's two people that happen to be standing within proximity that know this really cool, bizarre mechanical calculator. You said it had 600 parts in this particular device. And I'm like, shit, I'm just going to step out of the way. You guys have fun. <laughs> uh, John has, uh, uh, you, you've done some kind of crazy stuff. I've done a bunch of crazy things. You, 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 you're going to tell everybody all this I'm going to, that, that's, that's kind of the idea. That, okay. That's why I got notes. Oh, OK. You don't remember this? I mean, we know that Wynn had to practice. That's right. Oh, OK. So. Um, so, uh, like I say, John is the keynote. Uh, he's always got something uh, really interesting uh, to talk about. And um, it's my pleasure to have him out here. I asked him, uh, I said, uh, uh, hey, hey uh, John, would, would you mind, like, coming to my conference and, like, keynoting? And his response was, hell yeah, I'd love to do that. That'd be awesome. And I looked around, like, who's he talking to? So, Actually, uh, I, I, I said it would be an honor. Oh, sweetie, I appreciate that. So. <laughs> Uh, so without further ado, a round of applause for our keynote. Thank you. Thank you very much. When we were talking about this, I was trading mails with Skydog and Robin and said, well, so what are you going to talk about? And they said, well, how about you've worked at a lot of places, you've done a lot of things, tell us where you came from, what you did, because we've been trying to bring things into the southeast, get a lot of, uh, of things going on around here. And I thought that was very interesting. I, 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 I'm actually from the southeast. And it also means that it's a very difficult talk, because for me anyway, talking about myself is difficult. I don't really like doing it. So that's why I have the notes here. and. They also said, you could also talk about privacy and security and things that are going on in the world. And our email exchange started taking a slightly different, more interesting tone around the 1st of June, when all of a sudden things started getting interesting. So I want to start off saying that history makes sense backwards. It does not make sense forward. Whenever you look backwards, it appears like it was the only way things could have turned out. And particularly when you talk about your life, you assemble a narrative. And you pick out the things that make sense. And you throw away the things that don't. And this is a form of a lie. And we usually call this a resume. Um, and. So what I thought I would do here is not do the resume thing, which is you know how I got here and how it all makes sense, that I would actually give you the why it doesn't make sense, because in fact, that things don't make sense is one of the messages that I wanted to say. And that ties into one of my favorite quotes, which is from Sherlock Holmes, and it makes more sense to me every day, which is that there's nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. This is also a good security precept, that 
the more obvious something is, the less likely it is that it's actually true. Well, or more true, the more likely it is that it's fooled you or you fooled yourself. This is how really good hacking works. I mean, this is why rootkits work. It's obvious that nothing went wrong here. It's obvious that these things do, and you convince yourself that this is the way it's going to work. And so this is a story of how I got here, and it's a different arrangement than normally gets put on the bio you put on a thing, or, or your resume, or whatever. So I am from the southeast, but I'm also from nowhere. I come from a Kentucky family, hence, hence the good Kentucky Woodford Reserve iced tea here. Um, my mom's people literally went there with Daniel Boone. Been there ever since. I grew up just about everywhere in the South. And that, that's part of where I'll go. So my dad, I won't talk too much about them, got out of the Navy early mid 50s. Times were tough, there weren't a lot of jobs. His brother had been working for General Electric doing, doing radar. And my dad was thinking, oh, maybe I ought to go back into the Navy. And my uncle said to him, no, 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 you don't need to do that. You shouldn't do that because GE needs a whole bunch of radar techs. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that you should do. You shouldn't go back and do radio on a ship. And he says, I don't know anything about radar. And my uncle said, that's okay. It's a 10-hour trip. I'll teach you. And that's sort of been one of the inspirational tales of my life, that you can learn a lot on a 10-hour trip. And that many of the best ways to get to the best places that there are is through the side door. That the side door is, in fact, not guarded. It's easy to get into the side door. And again, this is, this is one of the great lessons of hacking. You don't go through the front door. So. I ended up, I was born in San Luis Obispo, California, because that's where Vandenberg Air Force Base was. And my parents happened to be there at the time, and they were moving around a whole lot, and spent time in Syracuse, New York, and then Gulfport, Mississippi, static, static tests for Saturn V F1 engines. My dad did that. Daytona Beach, Florida, Huntsville, Alabama, and I can tell you that Contrary to one of the things that they will tell you is that moving around is actually really good for your kids. Doesn't feel like it at the time, but it really is because it teaches you an awful lot of things like adaptability. And one of the best things about moving around is that when you move in third grade, for example, that really stupid thing you did in second grade that no one will let you forget, no one knows about. You get to reinvent yourself. You get to shed all your mistakes take a deep breath and say, I'm going to do it better. I'm going to do it right this time. You won't, but you'll at least you know, make different mistakes. <laughs> the downside, of course, is that you don't have a hometown. And I don't have a hometown. Facebook keeps trying to suggest to me hometowns. Oh, you haven't filled this out. And I, I, I've seen a couple ones that I would like to be my hometown. And when it gives me a really good one, I'm going to pick that one. So the downside is, of course, that you're not from anywhere. And I'm not from anywhere. But the upside is that you learn resilience. You learn to roll with the punches. You learn how to deal with new people. You learn how to deal with the fact that you're always the new kid who talks funny. Um, and so another one of the things that's, that's not obvious is that I'm a displaced musician. I always liked science as a kid. I mean, you know, I grew up in a nascent family. Loved rockets, blah, 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 blah. But I decided that I wanted to be a musician. Um, started playing oboe and English horn. Oboe, when I was 10 or 11 years old. I declined to take algebra at some point so that I could get more music lessons in. It wasn't until I was in high school that I really, I liked science and all. I started playing around with more things, and including one of the things that I sort of played around with was that by chance I took a Fortran course in high school. Um, 
And there's also always an inevitable competition with your parents, you know. Well, so what did my dad do when he was my age, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I have as a driving factor the fact that my dad sent people to the moon, and so that's given me a lot of pressure. So music was sort of inevitable to me when I was in Greenville, South Carolina. This was early high school. Ended up going to Furman University there. My parents took me in to see if they would give me music lessons. The guy who's the professor there said, oh, no, 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 I don't teach people that young. But I'll give him an audition, and I'll figure out which one of my students should be his teacher. So we went in, we did an audition, and when we came out, he said, I'll take him. And I almost ended up being a professional musician. Um, Dr. Cheesebro wanted me to go to the Sorbonne, be a musician, blah, 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 blah. And another wind of fate happened, and we ended up moving to Maryland, which he swore a blue streak over, and so on and so forth, because, oh, you'll never do this, da, 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 da. And damned if he was right. I, I was sure it wasn't going to be that way. My crisis on this came at the end of high school. I had decided that I took this too seriously. A problem that I have is that I'm a really kind, understanding person. Everybody else in the world, they're only human. They make mistakes, calm, don't worry, we'll do better next time, except for me. I had better be perfect all the time, the first time, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm intolerable on that, and I'm really good at hiding it. So there's you know, one of those things of I'm violating my own privacy. So I also lucked into my first computer job right out of high school. I, had, I bust tables for about two weeks. A friend of my father's who incidentally took us to Maryland because he thought my dad would be really good to learn to be a programmer because they played chess at lunch. Again, this is the side door again. Um, I did this quiz show thing in high school called It's Academic. If you're from the Washington, D.C., Maryland, et cetera area, you know of it. My team came in third in the whole D.C. area, and he thought, oh, hey, they needed a data librarian at, at, at NASA Goddard, and their current data librarian was out for surgery. Maybe the job would be only six weeks. And a data librarian took care of, like, all of the books, you know, when there were dead tree editions only. And I had a little card catalog that was all on punched cards. And I'd taken this Fortran course. And I will admit that the first time that I sat in front of the PDP-11 and I was reading the manual about like the CPU of the PDP-11, I really couldn't figure out why when you typed into the terminal, add R0, R1, it didn't work right. I hadn't quite figured out CLIs. But I figured out how to do a Fortran program, and I also figured out that if I wrote a Fortran program to keep track of my stack of cards for me, my job was a lot easier. And what they told me was, hey, this is really cool. If you go take an assembly language course, we'll hire you back next year. And I thought this was really, 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 really nice. And I also figured out at the time that the, all those washout courses, because this was in the very early days when there were computer science majors at all, and they had these massive washout courses at Maryland. You know, hundreds of people in the class, and they'd make you do all sorts of really hard things for no particularly good reason, where you really didn't, they didn't really tell you what the good for the program was. But I also knew that the main thing that you get when you go to college and your degree is that your degree gets you your first job. Your first job gets you your second job. And it almost really doesn't matter what your degree is in. It matters that you have one because that proves to the mundane world that you can sit down and deal with bullshit for four years. And, and if you do that, then you'll probably do okay. But that's all that it does. Um, and one of the guys that I worked with there, because I didn't know what I really wanted to do for a major, said, you know, what I've learned in technical stuff's always turned out to be not terribly useful. There's about a half-life, about five years on everything that I've learned that was useful. The things that stick with you, the things that, that are really, really important in life, those are the useless things. 
And there is nothing more useless than pure math. <laughs> so I think you ought to be a mathematician. The backwards logic of this appealed to me so much that I dived right in. <clears throat> So in all of college, I took two computer science courses. The assembly language course that I said I would, and a language course where we did like, you know, survey and learned Snowball and, 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 and Algol and things like that. And I worked summers and Christmases doing this stuff, and it was great. At the time, again, I'm dating myself, minimum wage was $1.65 an hour. I was being paid $5.05 an hour with all the overtime I could eat, writing stuff for satellite ground systems. I had a really nice stereo. <laughs> and I was always afraid to tell my friends that I was making three times what they were making. I was smart enough to be really quiet about this. But really, I learned that unlike music, where they make jokes about musicians starving, Computers was a lot of fun, and it paid really, really well. And so that kind of led me down this course. And one of the guys who was my mentor is, was known, his nickname was, You Spec It, I'll Deck It. And I developed a fondness for deck computers. Decided these people did things that were so cool, I wanted to go work for them. So I ended up in software services in DC, which was the equivalent of being an SE sales engineer at the time, except that in the time, you'd do things like give a pitch at the post office one day and write drivers at USGS the next day. And I remember one day that we were there where we were telling the postmaster general, yes, it was the postmaster general, why he should buy our computers, da 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 da. We were a really big company, you could do something. We had like 65,000 people working for the entire company. He leans back in his chair and he says to the salesman, son, at any given time, I have more people than that asleep on the job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, another one of those really nice lessons. So after having done that, I really wanted to work on the operating system. I moved to New Hampshire, worked in VMS development, ended up having job offers from both Unix and VMS, was told to go work for VMS because they had all the perks. It was true, but you know, it might have been more better to do Unix. I did all sorts of stuff. I did graphics when graphics was brand new and bitmap displays and workstations and things like that. I did user interfaces, got so tired of the damned users and their stupid complaints about where the damned pixels were that I went into the kernel and did memory management and schedulers and things like that where no one knew and no one cared and you couldn't even explain what you were doing. It was really nice. It's like the damned users didn't bother me anymore. And that was also where I got some of my first security things because we had a principle that no non-privileged user could crash the system at all and if, it, if they could, it was a showstopper. Really, everything stopped if you could, if you could root the system. And when I first started seeing Tamsin, they had a Vax there. She was playing some interesting computer games over lunch. The, the thing crashed, and everybody blamed her. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. That couldn't happen. Absolutely cannot happen. And she was working in the RT11 group, and it was, there was a certain amount of friendly rivalry between the PDP11 people and the Vax people. And I said, no, 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 no. Couldn't possibly happen. I said, if you can make it happen again and send me the crash dump, I will buy you dinner at any restaurant in the world. Not transportation, but any restaurant in the world. Yeah. And they couldn't. Um, and that was one of the places where I kind of learned craft about programming, where, you know, just like when you're doing music, you do your scales over and over again. You do your scales over and over again. I really liked computers because when you fix a bug, it stays fixed. If you play a really good part, a really good solo, there is no guarantee that you will turn out that way the next day. And as a matter of fact, a really good chance that it'll, you'll just absolutely flub it because that's what Murphy does to you. And eventually, 
you know, the recession of the 90s happened, um, personal computers blew away everything else, um, 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 it was a really nice place to work, it turned into one of the most amazingly horrible places to work, where, you know, I spent one time when things were really bad, I was supposed to write the graphics driver for a plain old VGA, XVGA card that went into an alpha, and they wouldn't buy the card. And they wouldn't buy us pens and post-its. And I learned from my manager a really great technique that was called virtual meetings. And just like virtual memory is real memory, well, it pretends to be real memory, but it's backed up by a small amount of real memory. A virtual meeting is like a real meeting, and you can have it in Maynard, and you can charge mileage for it, but it really happens in your own cafeteria. And if you do that for like a month, you can afford to get the graphics card that they won't pay for so that you can do your work. And I also learned at that time, don't ever fall in love with your job. Your job will not requite your love. Nobody ever sat on their deathbed saying, I really wish I had worked more. Now part of all of this was that we, meaning Tamsin and me and a few friends of ours, formed a new company, we did our own little startup, and I was at some party where kind of admitted to some upper level manager that we'd started our own startup, and he said, good, good, that's great. He says, I really worry about people who have, don't have their the thing on their side, I think we need to fire all of them. Okay. And um, she became the CEO because she was the first one of us to get laid off. Um, me and my partner, who were the main technical guys, we told her one day, you drew the short straw, we're going to make you be CEO. And I also learned to trade up. If you spend a lot of time in one job, they tend to pay you badly. They take you for, for granted. And the way that you fix this is you change your jobs. And I spent a few years when we were there, if somebody would pay me, more than 5% more, I would take their job. And I went from not making a whole lot of money and being in a weird situation where it was the recession. We were having trouble with the mortgage. We couldn't get a lower interest rate because we didn't make enough money to qualify for the new mortgage with the lower interest rate that we could afford better. Okay, fine, whatever, whatever, whatever. This was also where I got my MBA in the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, we got a business guy in who was an old Procter and Gamble guy. He taught us a whole bunch of stuff, including really good stories about Mr. Whipple. Um, um, yeah, yeah, if you've never seen Charmin Tissue, he was one of the people who helped create Charmin Tissue as a brand. And, and, and go get one of the HP financial calculator things, HP 16. They still make them. There's a manual that comes with it. And when you understand everything that is in the manual, you know everything that they will teach you as an MBA. <laughs> there's, there, there, there's, there's no answer key or anything like that. But, but, but when you understand everything in the HP16C, you know everything that an MBA knows. This was also where I got my first small taste of crypto because people said this was the, the internet was brand new. This was, this was 93, 94. They said, oh, we'd love to do collaboration on the internet. And that's what, this is what we did. We did collaboration tools. We did meetings. We did, we did, we did WebEx 20 years before WebEx. And my PowerPoint slide things from 1990 something works better than theirs and it pisses me off every time I have to do a WebEx. Dear God, just absolute crap. They said, okay, we don't want to be spied on on the internet while we're doing our sensitive meetings. And that was sort of like my first taste of surveillance on the internet. And I said, okay, I got to learn to do how this crypto stuff. There was no SSL, okay? There was no SSL. So I went to what was then the very second RSA conference in, in San Jose. We spent our own money to go do everything. And I went into there and at the first break started talking to this guy named Bruce. And he had this big duffel bag and he just published this book. And I said, okay, I'll buy one. It's called Applied Cryptography. Great, I'm trying to learn what cryptography is about. I'll buy this book called Applied Cryptography. I bought the first copy of Applied Cryptography that Bruce ever sold from him. 
And this was just pure luck. And I looked at this thing and I said, okay, okay, will you autograph it for me? And he took the thing from me and he looked at it and he said, I can't deface a book. And I said, it's not defacing it when you're the author. So, so I went back home and started figuring out how to do crypto on the net, and I came up with some really harebrained schemes, some of which are sufficiently clever that I want to tell other crypto people someday. Um, and another friend of ours who had moved out to California from there had told Apple people about it. And, and, and then mailed me when we had given them demos when we were out there on some visit. Said, oh, I need to hire one of those world benders people. And I sent him, this was Gersharan Sadu who invented Apple Talk, among other things. That, he's, that I said, my ears are burning. I hear you need to hire one of me. And ended up going to work for him. They moved us out there. And the project that he was working on at the time was that they were going to build a very small computer. This was 95 that would cost about what a bicycle would cost. And the idea was to sell it in the third world where people need to have information because they get cheated on prices for their crops and so on and so forth. And we ended up with our funding on that getting pulled and ended up doing some other things which were, again, collaboration where you could do multi-person editing of documents on any editor in the world. Um, and which was you know, kind of cool, did a lot of great demos with it, but there were just ways that it was just not going to really turn into a real thing. We were a research group. And the other thing that I did was that Sudo had done AOCE, which was the very first product that anybody had ever done with the digital signatures, other real crypto, and it fell absolutely flat on its face because nobody wanted this in the mid-90s. But there was one piece of it that I thought was really cool, and despite the fact that if you looked at it from a sheer security standpoint, was not even really very secure, but it was really, really, really cool, and it was called the keychain. And the idea behind it is that it would remember passwords for you and type them in, 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 in so that you could do this. And I didn't invent it, but I helped rescue it from the trash can. And I'm really proud of that. So, we were there at, the, at absolutely the worst time to be at Apple because this was before Jobs came back. It was absolutely, this was like, you know, right after Windows 95 came out and before Jobs came back. And when Jobs came back, he was an old friend of Sadu's and had said that he was going to absolutely get rid of all of the research people and I kind of thought that that was a good idea, but I didn't want to lose my job was trying to figure out where to run for cover. I had learned where to run for cover in an organization at DEC that when I was at, when I was at Apple, you, know, you, you name all of your computers, and mine were all named for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know, I had one named the Heart of Gold, one named for this, because my whole attitude about being at Apple in those days after having been at DEC was, oh no, not again. Yeah, uh, 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 I, 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 we, had, we, we had a guy who was kind of like that. We joked about him. So at, at this time, wondering where to go, a friend of a friend had gone to the then very new PGP. I had contributed to Phil Zimmerman's legal defense fund and so on. thought, well, what the hell? What the hell? This sounds like fun. And I went and applied there to be a server architect. And unbeknownst to me, the gal who was VP of engineering was, was, was tired of things not really shipping, but also was worried that they had only PC people and said, what we really need in here is some old deck or tandem guy who knows a lot about servers. And I kind of lucked into it, especially when I said that absolutely I'm, I was sick of things not shipping. And after having been there for a while, I got made to be chief scientist in one of the inevitable, oh, you know, dot-com booms, shuffle things around because the money isn't quite coming in and this contract doesn't happen and blah, 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 blah. And that particular story, I won't bore you with it now, but I do want to point out that this is really where I really started doing crypto. I started dabbling with crypto a couple of three years before, but I didn't do crypto until I was, as my job, until I was 34. And my first job I got doing computers when I was 17. So I'd actually had a 15-year career before I started doing crypto. And this, this, this is why, you know, 
when you write your resume, you write the resume so that it makes sense that it's inevitable that you would have become a crypto person when in fact, oh no, 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 no. I mean, really, it's like here I am, there's, there, the, I've been talking for nearly half an hour and now the crypto starts. So PGP1 got bought by Network Associates, which was McAfee along, et cetera, with other things. It was an interesting thing because they ended up buying us when we were literally two weeks from bankruptcy. And everybody who helped make that happen was just absolutely the friend of everyone else because you know, we, do, we didn't crash and burn. That It was a really bumpy ride, but we landed. I stuck around there for shares to vest, got out, went to go work for Tahir El Gamal at Kroll O'Gara, which was kind of interesting because it was the merger of the Kroll security background investigation, et cetera, people, and the O'Gara people who make like the president's armored car, among other things. And it was, it was, it, I joined there in some respects a little too late because they had just gone out public, been bought out, the stock was all not worth anything. Remember, it was the bot dot, dot com boom, and Kroll and O'Gara were sniping at each other in the press all the time. And then Bruce Schneier called me up and said, hey, I'm starting a company, I'm looking for really good people, uh, want to join? And I looked at this because Bruce and I had fought a lot in the press over crypto and stuff. And it's like, when he called me, I sort of looked at the phone. It's like, dear God, you, mean you actually like me? We, we fight all the time. And said, absolutely, uh, 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 well, do you have money? He says, well, I'm going to get money. Bruce, when you get money, I'll come. And he did get money, and I did go there. And um, that ended up with a small, in the, in the real dot-com crash, we ended up ending up with the, the inevitable problem. Our biggest customer was Mark Andreessen's company that basically was roll your own websites, et cetera, stuff. We, they were responsible for about one third of our total income, and when they went belly up, it, it caused a cascade through our company. And Bruce had been really good because he only hired really, really, really cool people. But it meant that when you had to lay off 20%, you had to go around and there was nobody, you know, okay, you could find three people that maybe we'd be better off without. But after that, the other 17 people that you got to get rid of, you really actually want to keep. And when I got laid off from there, it was much harder on Bruce than it was on me. So, you know, because I understood what was going on and it's like I had, I had even said, months before, please, let's, let's, let's preemptively slow down, da, 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 da. And fortunately, this happened the week before the RSA conference, not the week after the RSA conference. And the marketing people at Counterpain helped me brush up my resume. I went off to RSA with, with my backpack and like 50 copies of my resume and so on, and the determination to do the Tom Peters sell the brand of you thing. And I was just absolutely terrified that it was going to get worse before it got better. Um, one friend of mine thought, oh, would you, would you like to come work for Engl in, in England with me? This was Encipher. And I ended up going to work for Wave Systems, who were actually still around. And they, they were nine miles from my house. It was the recession coming in, and they matched my old salary. Again, smooth landing. Um, after that, a bunch of us old PGP people, uh, network associates, McAfee, canceled PGP. We got together. We thought that we should buy it. I had had this idea for what I called zero-click encryption. The idea being that everything would be done by the servers for you. We did not have the word cloud at the time. Servers would manage it for you, blah, 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 blah. Pitched this to a bunch of people, and we had two paths. One was we'd buy this PGP stuff from McAfee, and the other one was that we wouldn't. And we knew that the McAfee people had canceled like four or five other previous people trying to buy the thing. So our banker called up their banker and started talking, saying, you know, hey, do you actually want to sell this thing? Well, I represent a real startup with real money, and we are a real thing, and if you'll sell it to us, and the people who didn't want to sell it because that would mean they would look bad, were actually on vacation, and we managed to buy it while they were on vacation. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> um, 
so PGP Corp, my PGP, PGP2, we did various things with enterprise encryption and so on. Ultimately, Symantec bought us. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of more, these other things because I think we should get to some of the more fun stuff. And after that, I went back to Apple. That friend of mine who was there said, oh, hey, we need some things. And I, and I interviewed over there, got a job offer, and then they said, my first day there, okay, what we really wanted you to do is that we really want you to design for us whole disk encryption because we think this is a really good thing. We want to ship it with the, whole, with, with the OS. Steve's gotten in it in his idea that we have to encrypt everything because people are putting their lives on their computers. I thought, well, this is cool. And one of the things that I really wanted was I wanted to get my hands dirty again because I'd spent about, oh, 10 or 12 years doing the technical executive thing and, and the coding in PowerPoint and so on. And, 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 and while I knew I was still pretty scary because um, I was really good at, at, for example, when I wanted to know something was going on, reading the code, finding out what it was, call the engineer responsible, have a nice conversation and tell them what bugs they should fix. Um, I hadn't done an awful lot of coding myself and I wanted to get my hands dirty again because there's a lot of people that get to be around 50, they've been doing management, another recession comes in and you find out that you can't actually do anything. And I wanted to know if I could still do it. And that was one of my major reasons for going back to Apple, was to prove it to myself that I could actually still do it. And so that's what I did. Um, and that was a whole lot of fun. Um, great place to work. They really do care about the users. But you know, also, it's an intelligence organization. I mean, dear God, everything is, is, is up one side and down the other. And um, I came home one day, talked to Tamsin, and said, I can tell I'm an adrenaline junkie, because here I am, I'm at Apple in the crypto group doing all of these other things, and I'm bored. I want something, I want, I want something exciting again, like, you know, startups. I know, I know, I know, that's how I know I'm crazy. It's like, you know, there are signs when you know that you're crazy. Yes, dear. Uh-huh. <laughs> and now I'm doing Silent Circle. Part of the not liking to talk about yourself is that I don't like to do marketing for my own things. But talking to Sky Dog, he said, people want to know what you're doing and so on and so forth because it, it, it also fa factors into a lot of stuff. We're doing encrypted phone calls, voice, video, texting. We do it on mobile devices, Android, iOS. Um, our founder, Mike Janke, is a former Navy SEAL. He left the Navy around 1999, started a physical security company just in time for 9-11 to happen and ended up with interesting contracts like defending the Baghdad embassy and delivering the mail in Afghanistan where it's actually very profitable, but he sold things off because that makes you nervous. And he recognized that when people are in hostile environments, abroad, whatever, they tell you all the sorts of things that you're not supposed to do. Oh, don't do this, don't do that. That's not safe. That's not, you know, you, you can't do that if you want to. But they never tell you what you should do. And people who are abroad have to do regular everyday things like get a PDF of a mortgage or a rental agreement, sign it, scan it, send it back. You know, tell your mother happy birthday, and so on and so forth. And he wanted to start a company that would do this. And me, I said, oh, you're absolutely crazy. There's like, you know, 20,000 pe 20, people in the whole world who would ever want this. They're not gonna da 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 I'll be Mr. Rain on your parade. And he kept getting me more and more involved in it. And at the beginning of this year, I went full time over to there where we started doing it last October, almost exactly one year, and it's been running, and it, it's, it's actually, it actually works very nicely. I mean, I've, I've been really amazed at how well things have been going. So the basic idea then is that it's apps on your phone because it's a mobile, mobile world. Uh, you know, we are in the midst of a revolution that is every bit as big as the PC revolution, 
every bit as big as the mini computer revolution. It's a once every 20 to 30 years thing. And, and we're all carrying these computers and nobody's doing anything to really secure them very well. So why not? Why not? Sounds like fun, actually. So anyway, that's kind of what we, what, what we did. And one of the things that I have learned, several of them, is that, you know, to me anyway, mobility is the key to actually getting somewhere, which, you know, ties into the mobile computers. But you make your own luck. Chance favors your own mind. And I really genuinely believe that most of what goes on in life is, in fact, luck. There's a lottery that goes on every day, and you get more lottery tickets if you're smart, you get more lottery tickets if you are a, a hard worker, you get more lottery tickets for being pretty, you get more lottery tickets for being tall, and all of these other things, but at the end of the day, somebody spins a wheel and hands out things, and, and there are lots of people who, who, who win a prize who really didn't deserve it, and there are plenty of people who do, but at the end of the day, the thing that you do when you like, you know, practice every day, come in on time and all that is to collect more lottery tickets. And it, all, it usually is not people's fault one way or the other. And really, I know that I got lucky as much as anything else. I happened in many cases to be in the right place at the right time. Um, I was smart enough to recognize that the guy pulling the blue books out of his duffel bag was onto something and, and said, I'll give you cash for it right now. But it was just pure luck that I happened to be there. It was pure luck that, that, that I called this friend of a friend who has had jobs at PGP. It would have been a completely different career if I had gone and done other stuff, you know, continued on the, on the collaboration path because a bunch of the people that I worked with at Apple before then went on to form WebEx. Um, there were people who did all sorts of things where, where there are, you know, crash and burn startup stuff. But it's also a whole lot of fun. I mean, you know, the excitement of doing this stuff and finding something new is, is one of the things that's important. My old music teacher said that you retire the day that you stop learning, and that some people do, some people retire the day after they graduate from high school, and some people retire the day before the funeral, and it's really up to you which one of those that you do. And every time you learn something new, you're you're away, you're not retired yet. You're doing more good things. So. I'm going to move a little bit more into, oh, all of the interesting summer of things, which has been very, very interesting, you know, Snowden and all of that. Another one of my faults is that I don't actually really believe that there's a lot of evil in the world. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure there is. There's lots of, but, but I believe in stupidity, you know. What drives things is stupidity more than anything else. I, I, I believe that, that we will find out that dark energy, which is like 90% of everything and makes it so that galaxies don't rotate as fast as they really should, that's stupidity. It's the, the fact that the stars out there are dumber than the ones over here and they just, oh, hey, yeah, you're right. It's the fundamental rule of security. Never attribute anything to malice that can be, that can be accounted for by, security, by, by, by stupidity. Um, and we're, the world's filled full of it all. And most of the things that go wrong and most breaches and all of these things are just somebody being careless or stupid. And an, another one of my favorite southeastern southerners who's you know, somewhere in my extended family. It's a guy named James Branch Cabell, whom I recommend as an author a whole lot. And one of his quips was that optimists think that this is the best of all possible world, and pessimists are deathly afraid that the optimists are right. You know, what if, what if it really doesn't get any better than this? I mean, you know, what if this really is the best that it is? Uh, back in DEC, the group that I was in 
There was one time that, that there was some article in the ACM that said that we were arguably the best software engineering organization in the world. And one of my coworkers went, that's the most depressing thing I've ever heard. I've had this dream that I could leave here and go where people were actually competent. You mean that there was really genuinely nothing better than this? That is just so depressing. And, that, and that's, that's actually kind of the, the, the world that I live in, that, that another one of those sayings is that an optimist is never pleasantly surprised. And I tend to appear to be cheerful because I'm always pleasantly surprised. It's never as bad as I thought it was. I mean, you know, I get out of the car and think, oh my god, I survived. I got to work in it safely. And there are people who confuse this with being cheerful. Some idiot didn't broadside me. So, privacy. One of the things that just really, I am just so sick of this. And, and I, have, I, I have to deal with it every day. I had to deal with it again today. And someone says, oh, so what do you, you, know, what do you think about like, you know, terrorists and criminals? If you give people tele telephone calls that they can do and no one can spy in, doesn't that mean that like, you know, you know, bad people will do bad things? And part of me says, look, the vast majority of us are good people. And I don't see why it is that we have to put up with crap because there happen to be bad people out there. It's like punishing the class because there's one person in there that can't sit up. We don't say, oh, hey, Safeway, Safeway needs to do background checks because if we didn't sell food to criminals, they would starve. <laughs> but we do say, oh hey, you know, you know, you know, you 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 should put up with the government listening in. You should put up with with the Chinese stealing your 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 information because what about terrorists? You know, Q organ. And one of the things that we have to do is to stop being despairing on privacy. And there's lots of people who are despairing on privacy. You know, there's the McNeely quote, privacy is over, you know, get over that there's no privacy, and so on and so forth. Most of the people who will go on about how there is no such thing as privacy anymore and you should get over it are people who are profiting from the fact that they're violating your privacy. And they have a financial interest in making it so that we don't have nice things. And I'm guilty of this as much as anyone else. You know, I am a sinner too on this. That, that I sometimes get really depressed on this stuff. But, but, but that's why I've, stepped, I've stayed with all of this. Is that, damn it, somebody has to do it. That when I was thinking about going to work for PGP the first time, it really was, I can get paid, and I can do something that's fun, and I can actually fight back. And who cares if it's a lost fight? I mean, um, you know, the Rebel Alliance is always the underdog. History is not inevitable. It really is that those of us who are out for right, the odds are against us, and we do actually win a lot more than we should, and it looks inevitable when you look at it backwards, but, but, but you know, we are at a time now when, when it looks scary because we can't see a year from now. It's also a problem, I think, because part of what we do is that technology is not going to solve everything. And that is one of the things that we have to figure out. That, that what I call policy is that, you know, we just decide that we're going to do things this way. You can even call it manners, you can call it, you can call it law, you can call it anything. As an example, for us, it is not considered appropriate to pen test someone's store by pitching a brick at the window. It's also not appropriate to say, ha ha, your, 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 you, know, I, you know, I broke the security 
in your storefront because you didn't reinforce your window. Now on the other hand, despite the fact that Weave is really not a nice man, he should not have gone to prison for having told someone that, that, that they had, they, they, they'd coded the account number in the URL, which is what happened. And we have to have a way around this. And, and this is also the problem we have with the NSA. I don't mind that the NSA is spying on Libby and whomevers. It's what I pay them for. Um, I'm only a little peeved about the most recent things like, you know, spying on 35 of our allies. And a friend of mine who's a reporter who, who writes for a German newspaper pointed out that we, the US, spend 53% of all of the world's budget on defense. We spend more than everyone else put together. And what this means is that even though, yeah, 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 it certainly is true that all governments spy on each other and so on and so forth, um, um, and some of the spying that is going on is that our people are hacking the other governments who are spying on people, is that... I'm not sure we should be the world's policeman. Okay, I take that back. I am, I'm sure that we shouldn't be the world's policeman. I'm, I am, I'm an isolationist. I think that we should tend to our own knitting and this, that, the other thing, and part of the problem for the rest of the world and the reason why this is all upsetting is because we do spend more than anyone else. And I, 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 I don't think that these guys are bad people. Despite the fact that Keith Alexander has been lying to people to years, for years, despite the fact that Clapper, oh God, was that just hilarious. I mean, did you hear about that? That he happened to be, you know, leaking stuff to the press uh, Hayden, sorry, Hayden, um, leaking stuff of the press yeah, like yesterday on the Acela train down to Washington, D.C., and someone was sitting behind him hearing what it was, live tweeting it. Oh, yeah, oh, Google this when you get back to your room. It's hilarious. These are not bad people, and part of the problem is that they're not bad people. The problem is that they're basically Boromir. They think that they're good enough, they think that they're competent enough to be able to take the one ring, to take the one ring of worldwide surveillance and the tools of tyranny and not succumb to the evil that the Soviet Union and the Czechs and the East Germans and so on, and they believe that they will stay good enough. And that's stupidity. It's not evil, it's stupidity, and it's going to get us into a lot more trouble if we, than, than even evil would be if we don't fight back. And that's part of the problem, is that fighting back is we're fighting back against people who are good people. The problem is that 20 years from now, they're going to figure out that you downloaded a dinosaur erotica book from Amazon, and they'll publish that when you run for mayor. Yeah, all the people who downloaded Dinosaur Erotica are chuckling in the back. <laughs> For those of you who are going, huh? No, really, look, at, look, look it up. It's a new subgenre. There's an absolutely hilarious article in Forbes and, 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 and Fortune about the two gals in Texas, you know, who are just out of college and can't find jobs, and so they write, they write Dinosaur Erotica. And that's... The, the, he said, if we do fight back, we're labeled as terrorists and traitors, and that's why we have to fight back. That's why we have to not, we, you know, that's why you have to go to the trouble of doing something that's potentially very stupid in a slightly different way. Um, when earlier this summer, I mean, part, what has been upsetting to me about the whole NSA things is that things that we worried about, things that we thought might have happened, it turns out that, that our imaginations were not as good enough. Cabell was right. This is not the best of all possible words. Those of us who were pessimists and thought, oh, well, they could be doing da-da-da-da, we weren't, we weren't depressing enough. So, um, and when Lava Bit got shut down, I had been debating with my coworkers about this because 
I really hated silent mail, which was our encrypted email system from, the, from okay, before the moment that we set it up. Because when I created PGP Universal, it was designed so that people who have sysadmins on their side can get crypto done for them. I mean, I'll give you an example. I run one of these servers at home. My 79-year-old mother uses it. My 79-year-old mother gets, gets encrypted email. The cost of, of her getting encryption for free is that I have her private key. This is okay when it's your son. It's okay when it's your... Um, when you're at work and, and it's like, you know, it's your own sysadmins because, you know, they're, they're the people who are on your side. When you're doing something where you're trying to be a service, it's a lot different because, because what happens when, what go, when, when something goes wrong? It was one of the things that even when I was at Apple we discussed where we said, here was what I would talk to the lawyers about the nightmare situation. Hi, I'm an attorney and I represent someone in a really nasty divorce suit. The soon-to-be ex of your customer has the family album on their cloud storage system, and my client is going to sue you because my client wants a copy of the baby pictures. Oh my God, you don't want to be in the middle of this. There is absolutely no, there is no way to win here. You know, no matter what you do, no matter if you give the baby pictures over or you don't give the baby pictures over, you are not going to win. And so the secret is encrypt the baby pictures and say, oh, hey, you got to go talk to that other person because I don't have the keys. And this is also the way that we get out of the, so what about the mean traders? Is that we have to say that, look, um, um, everybody's got something to hide. You know, even those of us who don't download dinosaur erotica. Even, you know, even, even people who pretend that they're drinking whiskey and it's really iced tea and even people who pretend that it's iced tea and it's really whiskey. And, and, and the tools of what's going on, the problem is that it used to be in the old world that the, that the rules of spying were that you only spied on foreigners. And they've declared us all to be foreigners. I mean, that's the real problem. The real problem is, is in fact, you know, despite the fact that, you know, we, we, we spend 53% of everything, is that we're all in the same category with everybody else. And that's part of what really gets me pissed off. And it's also why when, when Ladar got his things shut down, I went, oh my God, this is horrible. I can just see it. And then I started to get really paranoid. What if? There was a national security letter that had been given to my colleagues because I happened to be in the airport lounge in, in Chicago because I had gone to a VoIP conference in Chicago. What if they'd been served with a warrant that they're not allowed to talk to anyone about and because I haven't gotten it, I could shut the system down because, because I, don't, I have no reason to think that, that, that you know, there's anything that is illegal or whatever going on. I don't, haven't been served with this, so that means that I could shut the thing down. And if I were them, this has been one of my security precepts. It's like I, I've talked about traffic analysis and metadata for years because I thought, well, if I were the NSA and there was crypto everywhere, what would I do? Oh, I'd start scooping up things and look at the metadata. It's like, yeah. Well, if I were them, I would be typing up the subpoena to be delivered at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Let's shut it down now. And that was the real reason that we did it, was that we'd always worried about it. And when we found out that, in fact, what was going on was unfair, because what, what's turned out that really happened was that Ladar has responded to law enforcement requests before. And again, really, I'm not against the police arresting bad guys. I might be, have some quibbles with what constitutes badness, but, but, but no, 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 no. I do believe in laws. I believe in all of this stuff. I'm not an anarchist, um, which, you know, is, is, is quite fashionable today. It's a lot of people in Congress who are anarchists. Um, and so... But I don't want to be in the middle of it. I don't want to be the guy who has to decide where the baby pictures go. I don't want to be, I don't want to have to be in the position where I decide 
what the validity of some court order is, and we're in a situation where we have secret courts and secret decisions and secret counter decisions, and we don't get to see what it was, and Ladar was asked to turn over his SSL keys because somebody, everyone presumes that it was Ed Snowden, somebody, it was redacted from the court things, I have not asked Ladar if it was really Ed Snowden because I don't want to know. Everyone assumes that it is. And they asked for his SSL private keys because they wanted to scoop up everybody's mail. They wanted to see where everybody is. It's, it's legal for them under the Stored Communications Act to know when people log into their email things. It's, you know, it's, like, you know, it's just like you know, they can get a warrant to find out who you've been calling that is a lower difficulty warrant than a real wiretap, and, and they wanted everything. And the fact that they wanted everything is the real reason that Ladar shut it down. And it was the fear of that for why I didn't know what was going on, but I knew it was bad. So the truth of security that we all have to deal with is there ain't a lock that can't be picked. That guy knows it right over there. There is no such thing as perfect security. Every lock can be picked. Every, I, I can tell you all sorts of great things about how to defeat my own crypto. I mean, I've done black hat talks on how to defeat my own crypto. There ain't a horse that can't be rode. There ain't a rider that can't be thrown. Every security system can be breached. Every breach can be counter breached. A really good friend of mine caused a huge stir a number of years ago when he started doing exploits on people who were doing exploit tools. He came up with this really cool tool where if somebody scanned your wireless network with Kismet, you would pwn them and own their box. I mean, I thought this was the most hilarious thing I'd ever heard. But, oh my God, releasing zero days into the wild. It's like, you know, you, know, you, can, you can pwn anybody running Metasploit. Oh my God, isn't that so hilarious? <laughs> So the truth of security is that, is that nothing's certain. And the truth of security is that we have to have policies. We have to say it's not OK to do certain things. And I don't know where a lot of that is, because part of it is that for us, for our own job, we have to have, our, we have, to have boundaries for what constitutes a real pen test and what constitutes casing the joint to break into something. You know, yeah, fine, whatever. You know, that's why, and, and, you know, the good people have the get out of jail free car cards in, in their pocket for when they do stuff. But, but, but it's the same thing for the government. I do want terrorists to be caught. I don't care whether they're reading Angela Merkel's email. I'm glad they got a bunch of people in, 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 in Libya who raided Benghazi. But when you erase the difference between me and the foreigners, I start getting upset. And we need to have the discussion that says, what does it mean to have the lines that should not be crossed? What is it that you could do, but you, could, but you won't? What is it that you won't throw the brick at the plate glass window to pen test it? It's, is it really true that if I scoop up a lot of data, but then don't search it, that I haven't collected it? You know, you know, it's not the way I thought things worked. But we have to have these conversations. And, and, and part of the, it's okay to not, you're not a traitor when you have strange opinions or buy whatever book you buy or anything like this. This is where we have to have this and it's why we have to start really pushing back. And it's why Whatever went on with Snowden himself, it was very interesting because the people who are in this situation, who work for intelligence agencies and so on, there's a whole bunch of laws that apply to them that don't apply to a lot of us, which include, you know, if it's, if it's classified data, you're not supposed to look at it, but also includes a lot of things that got put in after World War II because we didn't want the good German things. I was only following orders. You're required to, if you're, off, you're given an illegal order, not obey it. Now, what, that, what, what constitutes not obeying an illegal order and what constitutes an illegal order gets decided in, in things that are not stacked in your favor, which some people have figured out to their, to their own regret. But, but if you find out that malfeasance is going on, you're supposed to report it to your superior. 
If you think that your superior is involved in the malfeasance, you're supposed to report it to someone else and not let your superior know that you're reporting it. What if you find that there's malfeasance going on, or you believe that there is, and you think it goes all the way up to the commander in chief? Well, the only body who's left is we the people. And I'm not sure I completely agree with everything that he's done, but I see his point. If you're in the situation where you're in a free society and you want to, free, you want to defend the free society, and you think it goes all the way to the top, you have to go do this. And it's part of the discussion that we have to go, the way we have to have it. And the more that stuff goes on, it keeps going, you know, I keep going the, oh my God, it's even, you know, it's, it's even, it's even sometimes worse and sometimes more hilarious. You know, it's like, again, I don't really care about the, the, 35, the, the 35 allied leaders. That's horribly embarrassing and really, yeah, you probably shouldn't spy on your friends, but, you know, snicker, snicker, snicker. But, the, but, you know, what does it mean to be a citizen as opposed to a non-citizen is the thing that I think is the fundamental question that we're looking at, which is the same thing as a lot of other security problems that we deal with. What constitutes a valid pen test as opposed to breaking in? What constitutes, what constitutes the difference between the sort of jailbreak that I ought to be able to do because, God damn it, it's my device, and the sort of thing that, well, yeah, okay, fine, you know, I, 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 I really should pay for that movie, even if it was only a book. There's this, you know, all of these things are intimately related to each other, and we have to come up with a solution for them. And I admit that I don't know what it is. Um, and I kind of know where I stand on a lot of it, but I, but I also see the other point of view on things, and we've got to figure it out. Because I think that Snowden was right that the real problem that we're facing is turnkey totalitarianism. It's not these people. They are, in fact, good people. The problem is 30 years from now when, just like we put RICO in place because, you know, RICO is a bunch of special laws that shouldn't have exactly been constitutional, but we took down the mob for that. I mean, it was a really good thing that we took down the mob. But now we use RICO to take down PETA and assistant superintendents of schools with sticks up their ass when they get made fun of by seventh graders say that this is racketeering. And, and you know, thank God that was thrown out, but it was serious for a few days there. That the problem's going to be what happens when the next people get in, not when these people are. And that's the real thing that we've got to do. Um, and I suppose at this point, I've ranted enough because I think I'm boring myself. And I'd love to answer questions. Anybody that wants me to comment on things, we can talk later in the bar as well. So, you know, whoever wants to talk, I can hand over this. That one's not live yet, but we can figure out a way to do a microphone. Yes. How do you fix an unaudible system? Ha, 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 ha. You can't. That's right. And so what we have to do is we have to, we, have, we have to have somebody go in. Oh, sorry, sorry, because this is being recorded, he says, you know, when we have secret courts and whatever things, how do we know what's even broken? Well, we do have sort of the meta document. And the meta document is, of course, you know, the Constitution and all the amendments and all of that. And there's all sorts of really cool things that are in there. Like, you know, my favorite amendment is the ninth, which can be summarized as this is not a complete list. You know, judges don't make up new rights. I mean, you know, James Madison at the time didn't want to approve the Bill of Rights because he was afraid that if they wrote down what people's rights were, that, 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 that their descendants would come to the conclusion that that was a list of all the rights that there were. And the people who argued with him didn't say, no, no, Jim, that oh, those are all the rights that they are. They said, Jim, our descendants aren't that stupid. Now, sadly, we are that stupid. 
And, and, and we, ha we, we have to be able to, we have to come back to basic things. We need something like the Church Commission in the 1970s. Now, part of Don't Despair is that in the 50s and 60s, when J. Edgar Hoover was doing a lot of the things that I've been talking about, you know, could happen, like, you know, you, know, you find out what porn people were reading, you know, and, and, and he himself had a fondness for taffeta. I mean, there were an awful lot of people in those days who really liked finding out who was gay because they knew, they knew how much it would destroy them if people found out that they were gay. And that's sort of like why it became a difficult thing. We have to have, you know, we have to go through and say these are the things that it's okay. You have to have a right to privacy. It doesn't say anywhere the word privacy, but, 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 but a friend of mine who is, who is a lawyer pointed out that even the Third Amendment, which one's that? You know, we don't think about the Third Amendment. That's the one where they can't, they can't house troops in your house, so we don't worry about that one because it never occurred to anyone that that was a problem. Well, that's privacy law. We have all sorts of privacy laws all over the place, and we have all sorts of things, and we have to say, look, you don't go look at things. There really are different rules for citizens, or U.S. persons, technically, because U.S. persons is citizens, green cards, and anyone here who is, who's here legally. And I'm sorry that it's hard. It's one of the things that I've had to tell my guys, because my guys are trying to run a secure VoIP system, and I've told them you can't keep logs. And they say, well, what about IDS? And I said, if you store it, it's a log. Well, that makes our life harder. I know it does. That's why our customers are paying us. I mean, that's what, you know, you know the whole point of being in a free society is that, it, is that it's hard. I mean, it's hard to be the good guys. We were the good guys. Okay, next. I'm, I didn't answer that, but you know. The, the, que the question was, was the Third Amendment used against the clipper chip? I don't know. I don't remember that one. Um, I do know that the main thing that killed the clipper chip was that my dear friend Mac Blaze broke it. And, and, and the way that he broke it wasn't, was not that he figured out how to get to the, the things that were escrowed. He figured out a way to lie to the system and to be able to construct a crypto packet that said, oh yes, this is escrowed, when it isn't. And so he, he broke it, ironically, the other way. And once it got broken so that it would be really easy to make things that were Clipper compliant but didn't actually escrow things, um, they lost a lot of interest in this. They said, oh, you're right, this isn't a good idea. Yeah, um, way in the back. And then a guy in the blue over there. What's the current status of Silent Circle in the mail? We've taken down the mail system. We took it down because present internet email is intrinsically insecure. It, um, maybe. Um, current internet protocols were designed back in the 60s and 70s when, 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 when everybody was hippie and it was shiny happy freedom-loving people on, on, on the then DOD ARPANET. Um, and we do things like write down your IP address in the emails, which now is geolocatable to a really fine science. It's like, if you want a really good black hat project, you can beat me to this one. Start going through mailman archives, pull out the received headers, and do movement tracking of people who were posting so you can find out when they were home. You know, do a little bit of anonymizing, but you can come up with some really nice graphs. And, 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 and all of this stuff is sitting there on mailman archives on every email thing that we've ever been using. So I have some ideas on how to come up with a different thing. Because if you take a messaging system and you start with a you know very primitive like you know you know texting or something and you start putting a subject line on it and an inbox and folders because you want to be able to put things from some sources in whatever it starts looking an awful lot like an email system people have tried to do hybrid things google wave was utterly brilliant and utterly unusable but it but but it was but it was one of the most brilliant ideas that i've ever seen it's just that i couldn't use it 
Um, and, and what we have to do is we have to get rid of SMTP, POP, and IMAP and move to new protocols. And, and we could make a system that was email because really, it, you know, you, 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 guys, you guys are techies. Go to a Unix system that's got, that's, got, that's got Dovecot and SMTP and Mailders installed. I mean, really, an email system is really just a bunch of directories and a specialized, and a specialized client that uses a query language called IMAP, which is like, you know, Lisp meets SQL, to, to, to traverse this, this directory tree. If you build a system that's got a directory tree of files in it, you've got an email system. You just need a new set of protocols. Um, what the, 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 quest, the question was, what if you made a system that split things up and stored them in different places? It's like, I think you almost have it. The trick if you're running a service is don't ever have your user's keys. And that's been one of my, my principles over the last couple of years is don't have the keys. Because, because and, 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 you know, and going back was don't have the keys. Because that's what you have to do. On the other hand, there's a saying that is the law is not an ass which can also be phrased as the law is not a finite state automaton. You can't do the Captain Kirk thing and tell it to compute the last digit of pi and then smoke will come out of its ears. It's too smart for that. There, there, the, 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 the law, there are people who also say law is code. Law is code, but it executes on a machine that has a DWIM instruction. That's the do what I mean instruction. And that's what judges are. Judges execute the DWIM instruction. And, and they're smart. So, so, from a practical matter, any time that you say, G to the X mod P, Your Honor, and that's why my client is innocent, you've lost. So, so, what you really want to do is to set up your system where you say, I would love to help you, but I can't. Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, and that's what you want to do. Yeah. That's what you want to do. You want to make it so that, you, so that you say, I want to help you, but I can't. And you also want to be able to say, Here's what I can help you with, because there really are bad guys in the world, and some of these people you really do want to get put away. But you know, you have an honor, you have a, 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 a duty. I mean, it's like I was talking to a reporter about things, and I said, you know, it's like putting back doors and things is a betrayal to the craft. If you're an armor maker, you don't put a secret chink in the armor. It has to actually work correctly. So anyway, the guy, you, you in the blue, you. you Um, the question was about the dual elliptic curve thing. I, I can, I, you know, I've talked to a bunch of reporters on this, and my, my view is stupidity. You know, and, 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 and I made a snarky tweet, which was, if they spent $250 million on backdooring things, and this is all they could do, we have nothing to fear from them. <laughs> so, so, having talked to a bunch of people, I believe that someone came up with this as a clever idea. A long time ago, there was a, there was a random number generator called Blum Blum Shub, named for the three people who invented it. Even It's, it's a really cool name, isn't it? Um, and basically what they did was a modified form of RSA where you sort of turned the crank on repetitive RSA and generated out one bit. And it was horribly slow. Nobody did it, but there's all sorts of really cool security proofs on it. And I believe that somebody said, hey, let's take Blum Blum Shub and let's update it to elliptic curve. And, and it never occurred to them that when Niels and the other guy from Microsoft said, you know, you, you selected this random point on this elliptic curve, and this random point implies that th that's essentially a public key, and the existence of a public key means there's a private key somewhere, and you can never prove that you selected it at random. So that means that you can never prove that this thing is secure, that, 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 that when, when they first did this thing, we all applauded, and their very last slide in their PowerPoint for this was, we're not accusing anybody of putting a back door in there. I mean, they basically said, we think this was a really stupid thing to do that you did for because it was clever. I think that a whole bunch of, of other people did it because 
Programmers are like anybody else. If NIST comes out with a document and there are four different random number generators in there and one of them sucks, but still, you get to do some elliptic curve cryptography, you get to do some programming, you get to throw it in here, do this other things. It's kind of cool, actually. And you go and you do it without thinking it through. Um, I will admit that, you know, not claiming that I'm smart. I'm not smart, I'm lazy. When I was at Apple and this came out, I only did the AES one because I was overworked, didn't have a lot of people, and I only wanted to do one of them. And I actually personally believe that the hash-based ones are more secure, but Intel came out with these CPUs that happened to have AES in hardware. And when I implemented this thing in, in hardware using the AES instructions, it was faster than even RC4 by like 60%, and I hadn't even gone and optimized my code. So it was like, woohoo, this thing is fast, and it's good, and I know what it does, and, and I'm lazy, and I'm gonna go do something else. I think that somebody were a bunch of, 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 of crypto programmers who thought that, that, that this document has four things in it, and I'm gonna implement all four of them because they're there. Um, either that or the NSA really are stupider than we thought they were because, I mean, really, I mean, you know, that was a really dumb thing. I mean, it wasn't even random. I mean, somebody was going to figure it out, and they did. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yep, yeah, well, um, what, sorry, um, um, there has been debate as to whether or not the NSA can crack things, and there's a lot of us who are cryptographers who start with assumptions like assume that they can't law violate the laws of physics, assume that they don't have secret alien technology and things like that, what can they do? And especially after some of the first Snowden things came out, we were wondering what it was that they might, have, what they might be able to do that we didn't know about. The fact that they had that, that 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 one of the recent Snowden leaks was this thing called Tor sucks, and and by sucks it meant that they can't break it. Indicates among other things that the cryptography actually works because if they could break the cryptography, they could break Tor. Tor is completely dependent upon the crypto working. Um, um, Orange shirt and Taylor. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, um, Adi Shamir, who may be, who, who, who's one of the people who's arguably one of the world's greatest cryptographers, he's the S in RSA, said, crypto isn't broken, it's gone around. Um, my old coworker at Counterpain, Drew Gross, whom I quote many times on this, he got the world's first PhD in, in, in forensics, in computer forensics, said, and this is why I quote him, I love cryptography. It tells me what part of the system not to bother attacking. It's like, you don't attract the crypto. Assume that the crypto works and go look at everything else. And, and, and the state of software engineering is so bad that we don't need crypto being broken. And, and, and a, a depressing thing, the purpose of a lock is to make them use a crowbar. The reason you put a really good lock in your door is to make it so that they view a crowbar and crowbar your door open. The purpose of crypto is to make them backdoor you. The, the purpose of crypto is to make them tailor a zero day or buy a zero day that will own you. So um, they want to get me off here, so I'm sorry. All right, guys, I know we got a lot of questions, and let's give them a round of applause.